Hi, I'm going to introduce uh, Leslie Van Stavern Millar um, very quickly. Thank you for uh, coming back. Thank you for being here in this braving this horrible weather out there. Um, uh, Leslie Van Stavern Millar is an artist uh, who is here as science woman. Uh, but Leslie was born in, uh, in Wilmington, Delaware. And she has her BA in Studio Art and Biology from Mount Holyoke College uh, in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Uh, she's also done uh, mosaic uh, work, instruction in Ravenna, Italy, uh, and uh, as well as in, in cost work with encaustic as well as mosaics. Um, she did in, her encaustic work in Kingston, New York, and San Francisco, California. And she has been a member, one of the, uh, the longest serving members of the salon. She has been a part of the salon since 1989. And so without further ado, welcome Leslie Van Stavern Millar. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So I'm going to just jump right in and um, by starting to uh, acknowledge the importance of Nancy Erickson and dedicate this lecture to Nancy and uh, as the founder of the Patty Canyon Ladies Salon and overall an exceptional person. So um, I, I'm beginning with a little story, a personal story. And the personal story is that um, in 1958, my family was living in Iran. I was eight years old. And um, because it was very difficult to travel back at that period of time, especially to go back to the United States, we did not take vacations in the summer in the US. We went to Europe. It was the closest destination. And my mother was a young woman who was very curious. It was the first time she had had an opportunity to do any kind of traveling in her life. And so what she did is uh, she planned very strategically these trips to European museums. And so um, the memory I'm going to talk about has to do with coming back from one of these trips when I was eight or nine years old and having a lot of confusion because my beloved grandmother, her mother, and my beloved aunt, her sister, were both artists. And they had worked with me a lot as a child when we were still in the United States. And so I had this concept of people that were important to me and uh, talented were artists. These were women artists. And yet I had come back from these trips to the museums and not seen anything by a woman and I think because of being around my aunt and my grandmother, I had been thinking about being an artist, and it was confusing. I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. I mean, I know women can be artists, but there's no artwork by women. And all I could come up with is that perhaps women, like my aunt, had made a choice in the 50s uh, from kind of social pressure to start a family and focus on our children, and the art got left behind. And so I went, OK, well, maybe all the women are home with their children and they're cooking, because I was very young and had no perspective on what was going on. But at that time, that thought carried me forward into deciding I was going to be an artist no matter what. And so um, fast forward um, to what's going on now, uh, 60 years later. And um, I'm in Montana. I've been an artist for half a century. I've been living in Montana for half a century. And um, the reason I am dressed this way is that due to that interdepartmental major I have, even though I'm truly an artist, I incorporate some interest in the scientific process. And so this lecture was spurred uh, and is the culmination of two years, over two years, of being on a steering committee that Raphael Chacon formed with um, Nancy Erickson and Christy Hager and Stephanie Fraustad and myself to prepare for this show and for the symposium that's happening today. And I agreed to it, never imagining that I would be spending so much time in the next 24 months going through my photographs, because it turned out that I was the primary person that documented um, events through the salon. Yes? Oh, I thought somebody was asking a question. I, I, I ended up having the photographic data and also having access to other members' photographic data and uh, accumulating a lot of that material in fits and starts so that we would have information going into the show. And so uh, this is just a little example of the stuff I had to wade through. I had 19 boxes 
because I'm not an organized person of slides, photographs, uh, old, old computers that I had to have serviced, and spent hours down at my mother's house, um, which they have one in, in our lean near where we live, taking over the living room with the boxes and the papers. So this is primary research that I'm sharing with you for the very first time tonight. I'm a science woman because that makes me comfortable talking about theories and discoveries I've made. I'm really excited about it. And I want to thank so much the different people I spoke to that informed what, what I found. And there's two premises that I'm going forward with. And one of them is that um, the women's movement that originated in the 20s in the United States and that had its second wave in the um, 1970s and 1960s help carry forward what we're seeing today uh, in the women's art group that we are sort of an example of, basically, and that those forces were a combination of passionately dedicated to creativity and innovation um, fueled by um, hard work and persistence to come to where we are today, which has had, I think, a profound, it's evidence of and is an example of profound cultural change. So that's, that's one. And the other thing is that when important things like this are happening, oftentimes it's not obvious until you come in retrospect and look at it from behind, or you have someone like Raphael who identifies something that you've been involved with but have been so immersed, immersed in that you aren't seeing what the real repercussions are. So those, that's where I'm starting. So here we go. Um, I got really excited when I found um, imagery of the women's movement. This is from a march in uh, New York City in 1970. Um, and I have to say that out of the nine members of the Patty Canyon Ladies Salon that form the core of the exhibit downstairs, Nancy Erickson was born in 1935. She was clearly the founder and the den mother and the originator of this. But the other, other six artists, it, with the exception of two that are uh, a bit younger, the other six of us were born from 1946 to 1954. So there's a stretch there. And that means that this core group were part of this exciting movement. These women were all the age that I was when I was in college. And um, I, I just felt like it, it points out how important it was to experience this excitement in the United States with all this turbulence and all this change, and that as women artists, we rode that kind of wave of enthusiasm. And um, I have to give credit to the women's colleges, which I think have been overlooked for their important role in nurturing women artists. And I went to Mount Holyoke College, which had an art department for a long time. It's the first women's college in the country. And this is a photograph from 1900 of a life drawing class there. You can see it's women um, drawing a woman, fully clothed, very modest. It's kind of sedate. And then we move into 1940s. Um, this is life drawing at that time. The model's in a kind of a bathing suit. And it looks a little more dynamic. And then this one is from the 1950s. And they were apparently using students as models. Um, and by the time, I don't have a photograph, um, by the time I showed up on campus in 1968 and took a beginning life drawing class, I walked into class with my only experience previous to that. My mother was modest, so I, we never saw nude people in my family when I was growing up. It was all, everybody was fully clothed. But by the time I walked in and had only seen nude women in Playboy magazines that I looked at when I was babysitting, um, walking into a classroom where it's a female instructor, all female students, and the model is on a pedestal in the middle of the room. She weighs 200 pounds. She's an Amazon, totally, totally confident in her body, completely nude. And that was it. And it was a, a kind of startling and uh, really magnetized me into understanding that the conventional depiction of women that had gone through the media and that I'd grown up with was really 
wrong, you know, that it, di it didn't humanize and it didn't give you the variety of human bodies that were beautiful. And so um, that was a transformative experience for me. So now we're moving to New Orleans. And uh, there's a, a college that existed there, Sophie Newcomb, which was the first women's cooperative college in the United States, which means that they were the women's adjunct to Tulane University, which was a po very powerful school there. Um, and it had been founded for women to give women an opportunity. These, the, the thing about the women's schools is they were empowering women. And so they had an art department um, that became pretty famous for producing pottery during the 1920s and 30s. And those pieces are probably very highly collected now. But they, they really empowered their students to uh, work in the arts. And so, um, and this is, um, I think this is Mr. Woodward with his art class in front of the art building at the turn of the century. So the story, this is my origin story. So the origin story, the furthest back I can go with the um, Patty Canyon Lady Salon, is that um, in the 40s, four women graduated from, uh, I got that up there, yeah, four women graduated from that program, four women that became artists. These are their names. They stayed in New Orleans. They were very, very serious artists. Um, and so they, they had life drawing sessions at their, one of them, their home. They moved around somewhat, but uh, they also, I think Nanette Keenan-Reed joined with seven other women artists from that community to form a gallery that was in operation for several years. But they were, they were, they were dedicated to working. They met once a week for five hours, which should impress those of us that draw. That, that's heavy duty. They'd meet in the morning, take a break at lunch, and, and come back in in the afternoon. So what happened is they were apparently looking for a model, and they had a photographer friend who was perhaps younger and maybe part of more of the contemporary scene. And he knew Patricia Forsberg and her friend, um, Kathy Massimini, uh, who were both nurses at that time. Uh, Patricia, as she would describe, she said she was kind of a hippie at this stage. She was probably in her very early 20s. And she, she and her friend were both in the nursing uh, profession at one of the hospitals, but they weren't convinced that was really what they wanted to do. And you have to keep in mind that in the 60s and early 70s, there were not a lot of choices available for talented women to go into fields to make money or have occupations. They were very, very limited. You were a teacher, you were a nurse. Anyway, so they were approached by this photographer who said that he knew this group of women and would they like to model? And he put them in contact and history is made because <laughs> Patricia uh, really enjoyed those sessions. Uh, they were, the, the women created a really professional accepting atmosphere. They usually met at one of the artist's homes. Sometimes they met outside. It was a warmer climate. Um, and I think they, they provided food. They provided mentorship to these two young women. I'm not sure what happened to Kathy. You could ask Patricia. But um, Patricia was there. And then what happened is because her, her husband had a transfer to Washington, DC, and she was going to move up there with him. Um, she was getting ready to do that, and uh, the artist whose name was Ruth Hanau had a sister that was living in Washington, D.C., taking classes at the Corcoran. And I think she visited New Orleans during the time that um, Patricia was getting ready to move. And so Patricia had a conversation with her where she said, you know, I'm thinking about maybe I'll apply to the Corcoran, and I could do modeling there. They must teach life drawing classes. I, I could do that. And this woman, who was a sculpture student at the school, said, I think you should take art classes. I think you might want to do art. I'm, I may be putting words in Patricia's mouth, but you may become an artist. So that's what happened. So Patricia moved to Washington, D.C. This is the Corcoran um, Art Institute. And she started taking. Um, the classes that were available, and, um, and then she had a very positive experience with a photography teacher named Mark Power. This is her at 
uh, his home with uh, instruction to the students. He had a big impact on a number of students in photography. She was taking mostly classes in 2D. Um, and then she entered the degree program, at which time, after having been there a few years, um, they were transferred to Missoula. And she resumed. She got to know the art department here, took some classes, and then ended up being in the degree program and getting her master's and her MFA from the University of Montana. So here we see her in graduate school. So I, I, I just want to give a lot of credit to the four women in New Orleans who had this profound influence on a young woman that was looking to find out what her path in life was. And I call Patricia an agent of change. She was an agent of change. She took that energy, whether she was aware of it consciously at the time, and brought it with her to Missoula. So she got her, I think she got her degree in 81. Um, and by 81, she had gotten an outside studio. And by 1982, she had started hiring a model. And this is Rachel Simpson, who very kindly let me identify her. Um, a, friend of, a friend of that group, Joy Lewis, was a very good photographer and took a series of black and white photographs of a session at Patricia's studio. And so um, I'm going to show that a little bit. This is Patricia working in her room. And um, Angela Santa Maria, who ended up being uh, one of the artists I'll refer to when we uh, go up to the stage at Nancy's. And this is Anna Solwick. Um, and I think they met um, once or once a week or every couple of weeks. And they kind of said, and they met at night, which is interesting. They met at nighttime and they worked together. And um, there were other people that, if you look in the catalog, we have a complete list, we think, of all the the former members of the groups that especially migrated to Nancy's. And there's Patricia showing the work. I'm trying to remember if there's more to tell you about um, so, some of this, but I think the thought that it's, it, when it's happening, you're not necessarily aware of how the ramifications are. So this is Nancy drawing at that session. So, so the best recollection um, Patricia has is that she met Nancy through some of the art events, either through a show she had or one of Nancy's shows, probably downtown at the Missoula Art Museum, uh, where for a very brief time they allowed graduate students to have their master's show at the museum in the late 70s, early 80s. So what happened is um, this was going on. It was very successful. I, uh, if you listen to the interviews through the Montana Memory Project, you will hear, um, I think Rachel talks uh, quite a bit about like what the early stages were of providing this kind of atmosphere for both the artist and the, the models. But um, Patricia had other interests as well. And uh, she decided she wanted to um, move to Italy for a year and a half in 1989. And everything had been centered around her studio. And her studio was very nice, and it was in the downtown and she was going away. So basically, she had a leave of absence. And so at that point, Nancy decided she would move the group as it existed to her house. And at that point, I think a few people probably left. I'm not sure about it. This is, you know, this is like so many years ago that the memory of actually what happened and when is all kind of moves around quite a bit. But Nancy had a very nice studio that she and Ron had built in the early 70s, which easily accommodated the structure you would need for life drawing. And so um, she kindly started doing that, uh, which meant that um, a lot of the people from the group that Patricia had started came up there. And then it also left an opportunity for new people to come in. And I was very fortunate that one of the models that, um, that was working for Patricia was a friend of mine who, by the way, had gone to a women's college like myself and had a background in art history. My friend Virginia Rutherford had been modeling at Patricia's, and she knew that um, the group was changing slightly and that there was an opportunity for me to join. And so I talked to Nancy. And Nancy was like, sure. Go, come on. So I, I started coming up there. I was very, very honored to be allowed the opportunity to do that. And so here we've got um, 
a little corner of the studio that looked very unchanged over on the, almost the whole time that we we drew there, and it was this this table was kind of the corner of the area where Nancy would provide um, beverages and food for break time, and so that that was a pattern that was established early on and was um, lent to the kind of camaraderie that developed over time. So I just want to say, you know, as a photographer and as someone that has collected the photographs and appreciated the photographs I've gathered, the photographs have been my link to the history because oftentimes on the back of the photograph is the date or some note, like the, the ones that I've received from Nancy will have the date of uh, when the opening was or who the people were. Um, and then the digital photos that are more recently, they all have their data. But they also leave a lot of gaps. And the truth is that there's a lot more that has transpired than what I have evidence of, and especially the sessions, because there is sensitivity towards photographing models in an intimate situation like that. So there's, there, there tends to be more photographs as we get along, but they are kind of gaps. But the ones that we have, I think if you look at them, you can see pretty clearly that there is a sense of camaraderie and acceptance that I would say typified Nancy from the get-go, which is that Nancy provided an environment for people to flourish. There was no judging. I never felt like we had to show criteria or professional degrees or analysis, there was, no, there was no review. It was like, you do what you want to do, you take from it what you want to take, and this is the deal. We're meeting twice, twice a month, and you're part of the group. So I just want to mention, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of names, because it would be very difficult to remember all the people, and it's getting confusing. But um, in this instance, this is Cher Jones, who was a model for a period of time. And, um, and then I, I guess I would point out that Beth Sir was one of the early members. So we had a lot of, you know, in this period of time, there was a lot of coming and going. There were people that came, people that came and dropped out, and then people that stayed, and then people that went away for a while and came back. I mean, there's a lot of coming and going, and um, I would call this the early stage. So this is Aaron Lindbergh, who was also one of our models with a former member, Adrian Arleo, um, in Nancy's studio. Here we have Cher again um, with Linda Tawney when she was pregnant with her, probably her first child, and um, Beth. And the warmth that comes through, these are not like professional studio photos, but there's a warmth that comes through that I think exemplifies the kind of sense of acceptance, which really relates to the fact that here we're, we're, we're drawing the figure. Well, we're, what are we drawing? We're drawing women's figures. And I, by the way, I want to mention in the earliest stage, probably like in 1991 or 1992 or 1993, I do recall we had a male model because the models were in flux quite a bit at that time too. And that um, what happened is he was, he, was, he was fine and he was probably a model that had been also working at the university with the life drawing classes there. But um, the general consensus was after that he had come as we didn't we didn't need to do that again. We, like, we were like, OK, that's fine. Well, it clarified for us that we wanted to focus on the, uh, the female model. And so by the time Christy came, which was around uh, 1995 or 1996, that conversation had already occurred. And, the, and also to mention that one of the, one of the things that evolved was, um, you know, you didn't have, it wasn't mandatory appearance. So any, any time that we m met together, sometimes it was two or three people, sometimes it was five or six, kind of a full house. And whoever was there was privy to the discussions about the identity of the group or decisions that were made about the group. So it wasn't like we were calling meetings and official, it was very organic. I guess that would, would be how I would characterize it. There was an organic nature to the way that we were developing. And this was, um, this is an example of some of the very cool things that started to develop. So, okay, so the, some of the earliest people have left or, or made a commitment to stay. The group is starting to kind of coagulate around 
uh, Janet Whaley and Beth Lowe and Sherry Montana uh, and Linda Tawney coming in in the early 90s. And so uh, by this time, Christy had joined the group and she had a connection with Greeno, going out to Greeno, and she said, suggested we have a field trip out there. And so we brought the model and um, a couple of the artists came out and we had a really delightful day there. And this is Nancy Randazzo, who was our model at that time. And um, you know, those kind of special events uh, were very fulfilling and led to um, you know, us, us kind of looking at ourselves more as a group, I guess I would say. Uh, by the, the like 97, 98, we were starting to look at ourselves more as a group. This is not an exciting photograph, but it's important because you can tell, if you're one of the artists, you can tell by the background that that's sheetrock and um, probably newsprint behind us, and then there's artwork. And on the back of this photograph, which Nancy had taken, it says 1997 art show. So we had the, the, the first kind of official art show, although we had had a, a small one in 1991 in that early stage, but this was like sort of the germ of the shows that followed that. And, and also it shows Beth Lowe's mother, Quashe, I, I can't say her name, Ma Lowe, let's say that. Ma Lowe is there and um, she helped hang the show. I think she participated in a little bit and then she kind of disappeared from the group for a while. And then you'll see at, later that she resurfaced in a nice and uh, important way. So at this point, what we've got is three things happened uh, right around 1998. And in 1995, my husband and I purchased the Brunswick building, which I had been managing and had a studio in uh, since 1977. It's an artist studio building down on Railroad Street. And what was important about that is not by not being the manager, but being the owner, we were able to make decisions about some of the rooms and there was a gallery in the downstairs uh, of the building that had been rented as studios to provide revenue for the former owner. And so what happened is by um, 98, Max and I went, okay, we could actually not rent that room to the public and keep it available for projects. Like, you know, you could do a project in there or you could have a visiting artist in there or you could have an art show in there. And so by 1998, the group had decided, and I'm sure we weren't talking about continuing to do it for 20 years, but that was very important. We had our first show as a group. It was a cooperative show. And this was at a time, if you haven't been here long, there were not many options in Missoula in, at that time. You know, there were some, but they were pretty limited options for showing contemporary work by artists. And so um, that was important. And then following that, well, if you're going to have a show, you have to have a name. And so having the exhibition possibilities made the group at one of these informal meetings, probably over a couple of sessions, discuss, okay, what, what's our name? You know, we talked about it and uh, ultimately Nancy offered the, the final sele selection, which was Patty Canyon Ladies Salon. And so that was good. So we had an identity. And then uh, uh, something that Christy pointed out is right around that time, going from whoever showed up splitting the costs of the model, which is what had been happening before, going, okay, we're gonna pay dues. Everybody's gonna pay dues. You pay a yearly due, dues, and then whether you show up or not, it's not the burden of the people that are actually appearing. It's just, it's the, it's the way it's gonna be. And those three things really stabilized the group and brought us into what I call this next phase. In the next phase, I just want to talk a little bit about Nancy. It's hard, I have to sort of, you know, tamp down how much I would like to talk about her because she is so critical to what the group became. And uh, I just want to take this opportunity to say that this image, which is from probably around that right time, is it really exemplifies that what her primary interest was, was animals and women, and women without clothes on. And, and I talked to Ron yesterday and I was like, you know, I can't remember any artwork of people that have clothes on. I mean, I can't remember much in the way of artwork of men 
let alone clothed or unclothed. And he reminded me that earlier, when she was, uh, had recently left school, she was doing giant sculptures of women, and they are clothed. But honestly, I mean, that was a long time ago. So I feel like from the period that I got to know her and have been a participant in the Patty Canyon Lady Salon, she focused on animals and nude women. And it makes sense when you think about her work because she's talking about animals as a primal state, and I feel like she's talking about women as animals. And well, if you get right down to it, that's what you would do. You wouldn't be wearing clothes. So anyway, I just thought it was an interesting idea. But the fact is that by her offering her studio over and over again and very carefully cleaning it and having it arranged and having food and having hospitality, she really created this nurturing atmosphere for what I think is a redefinition of how it is to be an artist and how it is to be a successful artist. So here it is. Um, this is one of the sessions. This was photographed by Kurt Wilson, who came up to the studio uh, with Joe Nickel when they did an article about the, um, the salon. And it's, it's kind of nice, because normally we wouldn't have had photographs. And, and here, the same session. And I'm jumping ahead in time, because um, I wanted to focus on the sessions, because they are so critical to the whole whole thing. And this is photographed during the pandemic. And so we have Beth Lowe uh, working on a horse, and then Sherry Montana and Christy sketching, Becky Johnson sketching, then Janet. And I like this picture of showing Christy's being inspired by, by uh, Manet. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, uh, then uh, the, I like this because it shows the beautiful gulch behind um, the studio, which lent to the really good feeling about where we were working. The space was really, we really we were lucky having it available. And I, I closed the part of that sessions with this photograph of Nancy and Stephanie because what I, what I thought about is like when I said that things will happen and you're not really aware of the significance of what it is while it's happening is that friendships were developing. So we're coming up there ostensibly because we're working. We're working hard. We're, we're going to draw the figure and whatever. But think about it. It's like going from being sort of an isolated arrival in Montana in the early 70s that I was to starting to know some of the women artists to having exposure to other people that took art seriously and were forging their own particular career path every two weeks if you wanted to over a 23-year period is pretty, pretty impactful. Anyway, so um, Stephanie was um, the, the, the youngest member of the group. And she and Becky Johnson joined in 19, um, or 2000, around 2005. So with the, their arrival and the departure of a few of the other people that were in the initial group of showing at the um, exhibits at the Brunswick, things cut kind of settled down. So here, here we are. This is the Brunswick um, Gallery. Um, if you're not familiar with it, um, it definitely s has served us well. We sh showed there at least 20 years in a row with the only disruption occurring with the pandemic. Um, one of the good things about the showing is that we were doing it cooperatively. And so that meant that everybody participated. And everybody took different jobs. And whether that was hanging the art or sending postcards or talking to the press or sitting the gallery, all that stuff helped make us um, more aware. I think you, you, the, some of the best friendships come out of working together. And we had a common goal, which was to show our work. So this started to be something that um, we could look forward to. It kind of migrated to certain people like certain tasks. So I, I was on the hanging committee quite a few times, as were some of the other regulars. And again, the photographs don't do justice to the variety of how things were happening. But this was a session I documented. We also um, began uh, taking seriously promoting it once we realized we we're going to keep doing it. And the first few years, we used an image of a Greek bas relief. Um, and it seemed appropriate, but when we realized we were in it for the long haul, we started um, drawing names from a hat, and that person would have the image on the card that year. 
And so this is just an example of a few of those cards. And then um, Beth oftentimes, or pretty much exclusively, took on the role of mailing the cards. And so here's, here's Chrissy and Beth um, work, working on that. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know why I was there. I don't think I was helping. I, I ended up with all the, the, the cards that came back, so I was probably delivering them. Um, and then, and then having the shows themselves. So uh, Linda Tawney's here greeting a friend of hers who had come to see the exhibit. They were always in August or early September, so the weather was generally good, which was an important factor in the openings, which I'll talk about. Becky Johnson's working in the, at the desk. And then um, Nancy. Nancy was always gracious about bringing balloons and um, also um, was put in a lot of time to many different aspects of the exhibit. And uh, at this time, I used to have a printing press in that room. That was part of where the doubling function of the room was, um, which took up a, a, a fairly significant part of the real estate. And we moved that out. So in the more recent history, it hasn't been an impediment. And we, wh what happened is, but with these shows, we started having people that were really excited about coming to our events and would actually get kind of competitive about making sure they were there on the opening night at the time it opened or even a little earlier because they were trying to get the, the most desirable work that was the best priced work. So it was really good. Um, that got a level of excitement which translated into other people from the community coming perhaps a few days later. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to Mary Ann Forrest. So I'm talking about women's community, basically. All this is around women's community. And the reason my husband and I bought the Brunswick building is I had a conversation with this person in, uh, I think, in 1994. And she said, why did, I was managing it. And she's like, why don't you buy this building? And I was like, are you kidding? She's like, no, you ought to just see if Linda will sell it to you. My friend owned it. And I was like, I, I can't do that. And she's, thank God, I pray to Marianne. I mean, it's like if I had waited six months, the real estate market on the commercial real estate market in Missoula was going like this. And I got in right at the right time. I got a very fair price. Promised my friend that I bought it from that I would keep it as an artist entity. And um, anyway, so Marianne deserves kudos. And she's been a very strong supporter of our endeavors. Here's Ma Lo again with um, Beth's cousin Vivan. And we've got some of Ma Lo's work behind. So she never really fit our parameters of the figure. <laughs> we, were, we had discussions, which you might want to talk about in the panel, about whether we were showing art of the human figure and what were the boundaries. Could you add animals? And was it OK if an animal had a human in it? But if it was an animal by itself? you know. So these were all kind of spirited discussions at various times, but she kind of bypassed it. And um, she was a very popular uh, yearly uh, participant for a long time. And just to give you an idea, of, we had bins, which were always um, uh, uh, po possible options for unframed art at very affordable prices. And this, if you can see, the, the, uh, the nine squares of color there that is a piece of Christie's that you'll be able to see downstairs in the large gallery. Um, and, and one one of the good things about the time of year we show is that the gallery is actually fairly small. But uh, with the warm temperatures, you could have the doors open. And then we had all of our food for the reception, which again was a joint en endeavor. Um, with Linda Tawney heavily participating in that due to the bakery that she owns. Um, but it, it fostered a lot of casual conversation and interactions in the art community and in the, the, the community that was interested in art. And I think uh, that, it, that, you know, that's a long period of time to have that kind of connections building process that was all an outgrowth of this drawing group that we've had. So. And this is Virginia Rutherford. Um, and so here, here she wasn't modeling for us by this time, but she was definitely uh, interested in art and a supporter with Linda Tawney's husband. 
And here, I couldn't resist this. This is Raphael with Sheila Miles. This is about 20 years old. Um, uh, Nancy took it. But it just points out that this, maybe this came about because he showed an early interest in what we were, were doing. And this is not the only time he came to the openings. So uh, now I'm talking about like professional development. So basically, basically, well, professional development, our style. So, so like I said, I feel like um, we've had an opportunity to kind of rewrite what the idea of being a successful artist is in this country. And if you think about it, if the art world was dominated by men com pretty much completely, you know, for practical purposes until very recently, that's the role. You know, you're the solitary artist. That's, they, they all get together and look, and they're in suits, and they have their cigars, and they look very somber. Well, we're not worried that we're taking, making light of ourselves. We're having a nice time. So we had these um, publicity um, stunts, and this was at uh, Sherry Montana's with a vintage car that they had temporary or maybe permanent possession of, but that, that was... Um, a good time, and then a couple of years later, we met at Nancy's Lawn for something similar. And um, I think by doing these and, and uh, giving them to the newspapers, which the newspaper, fortunately, the Missoulian, very early on, I think even the first year, they started covering what we were doing. And so um, then we brought it up to, um, this was just five years ago with everybody getting a little bit older, but still enjoying that. And I say, I think that sense of play was really fostered by Nancy. If you ever saw her at opening, she wore very colorful clothes, shoes, hats, um, stockings. And so she was game for this kind of um, presentation of the group. And then uh, sort of an offshoot of that is we were getting, I mean, we basically got covered with a story almost every year. And uh, initially I was taking charge of that because I had the gallery and I had been organizing exhibits at the Brunswick building for a while. And so those kind of uh, connections sort of grew into a pretty consistent interest, including this article, which was, um, I think it was written around 2007 with uh, Joe Nickel, writing the article for the Missoulian and um, Kurt Wilson doing the photography. So it was an article in the newspaper proper and then they um, translated it to a glossy magazine that they produced a few times a year. And it's, it's nice because there's a record. And then Mama Lode, um, there was a connection through, I think, Sherry Montana, um, her daughter, Kathy Carruthers, um, did an article on us a few years later. It wasn't so much on the figures, but on the, the fact that we were working together as artists. And then uh, several collaborations with the, t the Clay Studio, which they realized that we would be a good complement to the ceramic work they did around the teapot images. And they asked us to participate by showing our work. And this has happened three different times. This is the first card that they did quite a while ago. And, and I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I think those kind of movements into collaborative things. Again, it was predominantly women uh, that were, were part of our identity emerging. We also began to have special opportunities. So um, Susan O'Connor, who was actively writing stories and journals, invited us to her very beautiful gallery out at Valley of the Moon um, a couple of times. And we brought a model with us. This is Anya Cloud. And we, um, we set up a work area, had a really nice time with her, and uh, it was very beautiful. So having opportunities to kind of shift things around was stimulating. And this, this is the same day. We're in front of a painting by a guy that actually is pretty well known, but I can't remember his name. He specialized in wave, wave and um, what is it? Yeah, he's, and I think he's gotten more famous since she hired him to do the installation. Anyway, <laughs> OK. And then. Uh, there were other opportunities at other people's studios. So Beth was able to provide us with ceramic materials at her studio a couple of different times. This is her mother who was a uh, participant in these. And um, that meant we were able to work with a different medium. And there was before I removed the press from the gallery, we had a modeling session at the Brunswick Gallery uh, and made Made, had the model there, and a group of us got together, and we were able to 
produce monotypes right then. And that was also very interesting. I believe Kate Davis, is that right? Did Kate Davis have us? I wasn't here for that, but Kate Davis had, had people out to see the birds. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and yeah, and then Sherry Montana, different artists opened their studios. Like at various times, Chrissy has opened her studio to host a drawing, and Sherry Montana has. Um, so we've had options that have, have uh, allowed us variety. And then I just want to show this, the um, images here. So this was a, a, one of our annual shows, and someone suggested that we each take a same size piece of paper and do a head. And so uh, this is the only existing photograph I can find that doesn't have a person smack dab in front of it. Um, that shows what we did, but I, I just, that again is kind of evidence of this cooperative spirit and yet no one juried it. It was like you just did what you wanted to do and then we put it up. So here as a result of all this kind of friendships and, and the, the, the maturation of the, the salon, we started um, also meeting together socially. This was a, a dinner party at the Brunswick when we celebrated an especially lucrative um, uh, exhibition. And here, Nancy was turning, I think, 70. We had a party for her there. And I love this photograph. I took it. Um, that's why I was in the other one. But I took this photograph because it really exemplified for me the beautiful spirit of the women's community. Most of these women are artists, but they're just women in the community that were had a strong sense of fun and celebration. And this is similar. This is at Beth Lowe's house. Uh, we would sometimes celebrate group birthday parties with her um, hosting it. And then this is, uh, this is another one of the celebrations. So I'm bringing us now, we're getting close to the end. I'm just talking now about uh, the pandemic. Okay, so the pandemic, everything's sort of cruising along. Things are like developing. We had a show planned at the Lewistown Arts Center for March or April of 2020. That came to a screeching halt. I think it was up to three or four days. And then there was a lot of confusion because nobody knew what was going on. So that opportunity disappeared. We stopped drawing for, I think, close to a year. Um, and it was very isolating time. And so very luckily, uh, Raphael uh, started talking to Christy at, in uh, like the summer of 2020 about having this show. And I was approached to join the steering committee, never imagining I would get into this depth of archaeological exploration of the origin. But I'm, I'm just bringing us up to this right now because from that point forward, even though things were challenging, it provided sort of a framework for keeping the group together because we weren't meeting. I mean, I think people were talking on the phone or emailing, but it was a very strange situation. So Nancy turned 85 in 2000. 20, 2020, and that didn't happen. Nothing happened because of the pandemic. And so the following year, when things were starting to look a little more reasonable, uh, and Ron and Nancy had donated a series of Nancy's pieces to the Missoula Art Museum, Laura suggested we have a belated 85th and 86th birthday party for Nancy, which we did. Um, and I, this is an important, but I just like the teacups. The teacups are kind of in, indicative. Um, and, the, and we had it in the gallery where some of the work that had been donated was being displayed. So that was really positive. Then we moved into um, trying to resume the, the sessions. It was kind of erratic. And you can see here that um, the model, Joyce Gibbs, who I have to say has been incredibly important. She's been with us for we figured out, I talked to her on the phone yesterday, at least two decades of modeling and providing so much care and consistency to the group and especially Nancy. And you can see here, I mean, she's got a mask on. I mean, so everybody was trying their best to do what they can, but um, Nancy was increasingly having health problems, um, which led to her demise this past winter. Um, you know, I think it was in February. And so this is the last drawing. I would sometimes bring my camera. This is the last um, drawing that I found in her studio after she had passed away. Um, 
So as kind of a follow-up to that is that in the period before she died, I had talked to her about an idea that Christy and I had discussed of having an installation on the wall, her big wall in that studio, of the fast, quick, immediate drawings that are generated by drawing sessions. Not the, not the work that you take home and do later or perfect, but like the immediate raw stuff. And that was at the initial suggestion of Raphael about two years ago about that we could have an installation like that in the gallery. So we, we got the idea, well, it would be really nice to do it with her wall and use that photograph. You know, we may be able to use that photograph in some context with the exhibition. And she, Nancy heard about it and she got so excited. She was like, please do it, go for it. And so we had some momentum after her departure to get those, those drawings together and working with Linda Tawney, the three of us worked on two different occasions to assemble, you know, this was one of the versions we kept moving things around. It was really hard and we were trying to be fair to everybody, but everybody's work is so wildly different, but it actually kind of worked as you will see later. Um, and then because I was up there working on the, um, the installation for that photo shoot, I, I got to spend time with Ron and we, you know, he was beginning to have to deal with Nancy's studio. So I um, offered to help him, never imagining we would unearth so many drawings that she had done of life drawing sessions that had never left her studio, never been framed, were in big portfolios or stuck in shelves. But we, it was a five month process essentially, but we decided to have a sale of her work to distribute it to the community during the summer, which ultimately happened last August. And I'm showing the, uh, Laura Millen here on the, the left and Becky Johnson in the middle and my daughter Indigo Millar on the right. And Laura was great. She's the one that said, hey, Les, why, why doesn't he have a sale? And we'll help. So the museum came in at the last minute and helped with the days of the sale, which was really great. Uh, Becky was one, the one member of the salon who was like a trooper. She would come up and help me when I was going crazy, looking at the different things that had to be sorted through. Um, and then my daughter happened to be visiting from her home and took over the fabric, the dispersal of uh, Nancy's huge volume of fabrics during that time. But it was a group effort, so it was very good that um, the Patty Canyon Salon people and some of the museum people came in and helped. And then Ron and Avery, his granddaughter, Nancy's granddaughter, were also really instrumental. And I just want to show you, I took this probably as publicity to get people aware that the sale was taking place. And I'm so glad I did because it was random, although Ron really orchestrated where I should hang things. He was giving me a lot of, he gave me a lot of direction until I was teetering on the ladder and trying to get him up at the top. But um, virtually everything sold. I mean, we did, did really well. And then through his generosity, and by association, Nancy's generosity, some of that revenue was donated to both the Missoula Art Museum and the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and it has helped fund, especially the catalog uh, today. And so this is the aftermath of the sale with um, everybody's kind of exhausted. And that's my husband over on the left, Max Gilliam, and then Stephanie and Ron and my daughter Indigo. So, some of the things that I'm excited about is that because of Raphael's background in art history and just his personal approach, it's not simply an exhibition. There's been all these aspects to it that I think the symposium is one, the catalog, and then he managed to get funding for that Montana memory project that he talked about. And this is the, um, the interviewer, Cherie Newman, interviewing Ron, and Ron was talking on behalf of Nancy in Nancy's studio. And, and I'm just urging you to sort of take advantage of all the different aspects. This is the catalog that ultimately used that photograph that we worked on. And um, it was produced by Joanna Yardley, and uh, Raphael made a great point about it. If you have any questions, the, it's kind of a reference volume. There's a lot of material there that can help you you know, if you want to know people's background or read statements from the artists and two very good essays in there, I really recommend it. So in summary, I'm, I'm back, I'm almost done, I promise I'm almost finished. Uh, back to this exhibit and uh, the profound impact that Nancy 
uh, of the kind of environment that she created for essentially the development of so many women artists in the community and using the figure as kind of the central core, but it's a lot more than that. I feel like it's a lot more than that and that it's symbolic of women taking their rightful place in the national and international conversation. So I'm gonna end with one quick story. I promise it'll be fast. Um, I just have to read you if I can find that comment. So the story to conclude is that um, in the mid-90s, I came to a lecture at the university over in the old theater, and it was uh, sponsored by the art department, and it was a man named Mark Stevens, who at that time was working for both Newsweek and the New Republic. He was an art historian. He was my age. Okay, so he was in college at the same time as me. And it was good. It was very informal. It was a small group of people. He wasn't like a household name. And so, uh, but his ideas were really good, and he seemed like a friendly person. So at the end of the, um, at the end of the lecture, I went up to him. He, nobody was talking to him, and I said, "You know, I want to talk to you about something I've observed." I said, "You know, I've I've been in Montana about 20 years. I'm a member of a women's drawing group, and we I've been in it, you know, five or six years at that point." And I said, "You know, my personal opinion." is that the most important thing that will have happened in the 20th century in the art world, or the latter part of it, is the emergence of women into the arts in a very powerful and forceful way. And I said, what do you think about that? And he's like, well, I hadn't thought about it. And I was like, I urge you to take a look at that. I mean, you're doing research on stuff, and this would be a good topic. Okay, so I walk away now. Two past two weeks, I was like, oh my God. So in the meantime, he's become, again, I don't think it's a household name, but he's much more famous. He wrote a book on de Kooning and very recently wrote a book on Francis Bacon. The de Kooning book he wrote in affiliation with his wife, who is also an art critic and art historian, Annalyn Swan, I think is her name. They got the Pulitzer Prize. Okay, so a lot of people think that's a cool book. Anyway, so I found him on his website after doing a lot of detective work to see if I was actually correct that he had ever come here and I hadn't imagined it. So I wrote him and I said, hey, I believe we had this conversation. Are you who I think you are? And by the way, this women's group I'm in is going to have a show. And he wrote me back, which I was really amazed by because I, I, I probably I didn't expect to hear from him. So he wrote back and said, you know, I think I do. I don't remember the exact conversation, but I think I remember it. And so here's what he wrote. I want to read this. I do believe very strongly that looking closely is a wonderful contribution to make. Artists may do so in various ways in our culture, including through life drawing. Everything grows more abstract. By that, I don't mean abstract art, which can be very real. I mean the sterility that comes when we leave the physical world too far behind. Engaging the human body freshly through drawing seems to me admirable. It's very difficult to do in a way that seems entirely new, since so many great artists from the past have worked in this way. But how many of us are entirely new? Almost no one. And there's always some light left. Women, in particular, are well-placed before the figure. Their view of the body has been, over the centuries, woefully underrepresented. Looking closely at the figure is a wonderful discipline, however it turns out, and useful to our being, a kind of meditation. So I want to close and say, I think he's sort of got it. I don't think he's really there. But in contrast, so he's my age. Well, Raphael's a bit younger than myself, and I have to really give him so much credit for identifying, you know, we don't have to convince him, I don't have to have that conversation with him, so I have great gratitude for you, you know, providing this opportunity to put us on the, on the mark. Thank you. Do you have any questions? My next what? Oh, then, oh, thank you for asking that. <laughs> I think I had a plant. Um, 
we're planning, so our yearly shows got disrupted, and very kindly, uh, Don Munt at Gallery 709 took up the mantle in 2020. And then, I think that's right, no, 2021. Is that right? 20, 2020. Then we didn't do anything last year. There was a lot of disruption. So we are talking about having a show over the Mother's Day period this coming spring. And Nancy's work will be represented as well. Yeah. Excuse me? When? When? Where? At the Brunswick. At the Brunswick. I mean, I, I don't know. It's a lot of work. But I have to admit, it's a lot of work. But I love the cooperative nature of the show. I think it really is an important factor. And, and it's simpler if you give it to a gallery. They're responsible for almost all the hard work. Um, but there's something to be said for the kind of socialist. <laughs> socialist? <laughs> I'm kind of a socialist. Yeah? Leslie, I was just really glad that you brought up um, women's colleges early in this presentation because it seemed apropos to the previous presentation. In the, the Q&A, we were talking about having a male model or having a male president. It, I, I think marginalized groups, including women, have often chose segregation for empowerment because you remove any of those dynamics of some of these superior or vying for power or, or status in the group. And it seems to me that the, it, uh, the choice of Tanya, for example, to be women working with women models just simplifies, in, in a social sense, the whole setting in which the creative work occurs. Mm -hmm. And those, those women's colleges did that for all fields of endeavor, and I guess still do. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, and, I, and I really don't think they're acknowledged to, to the degree that they should be. I'm sorry, I think they've been extremely important. Uh, and the, at least the college I went to, their whole goal is to create women leaders. That's it. They're not, they're not, they, they want you to go forward and, and bring about change. And uh, that sounds big. I mean, I don't think that people when they're 18 or 19 really understand that, but they set that. Framework. I, I realized I didn't show, I just want to uh, finish with um, my thank yous, which are myriad and really came through a lot of the conversations. I had great conversations with people about th this topic. I've had other conversations which are part of the broader, you know, with the broader membership of the group. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Rachel. also coincides with, I can't remember when it came out, but you know that the, the literature or a book came out maybe in the 70s or 80s about how if women are in women's groups, they communicate differently than if they're in groups with men. And I, I think that it's not like, I mean, we've had conversations in the group. I mean, I mean, at some point, some guy wanted to be part of the group. And so that brought up the, okay, are we going to have a male artist in the group? And again, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't like we had a voting process. But the general consensus was, no, this is women drawing women, and we're redefining the female figure. And, and we'll go from there. Any other questions? OK. Well, thank you. I'm, I, I, I think there's a lot more that the panel will be addressing uh, in the afternoon about specifics. Thank you, yeah. Leslie. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you.